Um, so we started a prog program at, at Tilparker, Massey's Hill Country Farm, um, in about 2012, because we recognised that we needed to think about the role of the beef industry in water quality. So there'd been a lot of attention um, on dairy cows up to that point, but we know that cattle are cattle, and beef cattle also have access to waterways. Particularly in hill country, because there's so many little waterways interwoven across the hillsides, um, that keeping the cattle out of those is certainly not the same equation that it, that it might be on a dairy farm. So we wanted to look at what does having cattle in those um, access to waterways in hill country mean for the water quality and, and how can we manage it. So we established a research site um, at, at Tuapaka to look at those things. So that's been running for a number of years now here at Site Now, Christine, thanks. So today we're going to talk about a number of things that we've been doing there. We're going to start by talking, Lucy's going to tell us about the, the background monitoring of water quality that we've been doing um, at Tuapaka. We're going to talk about some GPS monitoring we did of, of cows and streams and wetlands, looking at, at how they were actually interacting with the water. We're going to talk about a study we did where we used supplements to change the cattle behaviour um, and how that influenced water quality. And then we're going to talk about a, a hill country cropping study that we've done as well. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. So um, we, one of the things we wanted to do um, when, we, when we started talking about looking at environmental effects on our hill country farm was to set up an environmental um, water quality monitoring framework. Um, so we've been monitoring water quality at Tuapaka since 2013. Um, and the idea or the reason we're interested in this is that you know, we are seeing some indications from the government that um, there will be some economic benefits from increasing our production in hill country um, and so potentially we might be seeing some intensification in this area. Um, in addition to, but also independently of, um, we know that it's likely that um, nutrient loss restrictions will apply to beef and sheep um, farming at some stage um, and that we really need to know more about how nitrogen and phosphorus and particularly sediment is lost from these systems. So, what we're, what we're thinking there is that if we have more information in this area, we'll be able to assist farmers um, and also councils to manage the issue and make some really good decisions about um, you know, managing those issues in hill country. Um, we also want to, want to uh, provide more data and research to um, strengthen models that we use routinely for nutrient management, such as overseer. So our Hill Country uh, Water Quality Monitoring site um, or setup looks like this. So this is our Hill Country farm at Tuapaka. Um, so this is the top of the farm here, um, the top of the hill. So if we look out the window, we might be able to see some of the windmills that are on the top of our farm. Um, and then heading down through the farm, and here's our, our flat area here. Um, so at the very top of the farm, this is our first water quality monitoring site. So um, this is the edge of our property. Um, so we've got water coming in from a forest area. Um, and then we're monitoring at the top as water goes into a hill country wetland, just a naturally occurring wetland. Um, monitoring as the water exits that wetland. Um, uh, we've got another sort of intersection of a couple of different um, subcatchments that we're monitoring at. Um, our main weir, which integrates uh, an area of 85 hectares, and so that allows us to sort of look at, um, you know, a larger sort of area and impacts uh, on water quality. And then we've got a, a weir down the bottom of the farm. So today I'm just giving a really quick snapshot of what we're doing. So if anyone's particularly interested in this data or what we're doing, um, please come and see me afterwards. Okay, so I'm just going to give you one example of, of what we're finding. So this is just a typical example. So on this graph, um, this, this is data measured over a year from June to June. The blue lines represent the stream flow. Um, so you can see during the wet winter months and early spring, you know, we're seeing an increase in stream flow. Uh, the red dots represent different forms of nitrogen. So the solid red dots are total nitrogen and the open red dots are nitrate. Um, so what you can see is um, early in the season, um, we, we're tending to get some elevated both nitrate concentrations and also nitrogen. Um, so some of that's associated with um, higher rainfall events, so pushing some of that nitrate through the soil profile and it's ending up in the stream. Um, the other thing to point out is 
We also get, particularly over the summer months, nitrate concentrations that are actually below our limit of detection in the laboratory. So, um, you know, it's really nice to have some, some data around this to start looking at things. Um, the other thing that's happening, of course, is we've got animals in the system. So over this period, we do a lot of our grazing in hill country. Um, we've got a fertiliser event here on the 2nd of um, September. Um, but one of the things that we've realised with this monitoring program is we're sampling water every two weeks, which is quite... Um, it's, it's perhaps more common than our routine. Often, often um, councils, for example, sample every month. So this is fairly... Um, you know, sort of higher frequency water quality monitoring. But what we've um, quickly realised is it's really hard sampling every two weeks to actually pick up some of these management effects to start to think about how we might be able to um, improve. Um, and here's a good example. So this, uh, the blue line is our water flow, our stream flow, and these red arrows indicate where we've taken our water samples. So you can see, um, you know, there's a couple of high flow events that we haven't actually captured, that they've happened and then we've sampled, um, we've been out the next day or the, the day after. Um, we, we do try and do opportunistic, sam opportunistic sampling, so we try and get out there when we know it's raining, but for many of you, you'll, uh, you'll appreciate that, um, you know, it's, it can be quite, um, you know, wet and windy, um, quite dangerous and, and often some of these events happen in the middle of the night, which is quite difficult to sample. So. Um, what this has led us to is the real need for uh, more high frequency sampling. Um, and so this is an example here of a nitrate sensor. Um, this is uh, a piece of equipment that's made in Europe. Um, so we've masses invested in two of these nitrate sensors. So they measure nitrate in water every 15 minutes. So a real step change in how we might monitor water quality. Um, we've been lucky, we've had a collaborative project with a scientist in Northern Ireland um, and we've been using some of this equipment to monitor water quality in the Manawatu River. Um, so we had a study in 2016-17 um, and so this just gives you an, an example of the sort of data you can get with this equipment. So the blue line again is the water flow um, and the red dots are nitrate concentrations me measured every 15 minutes. So with this sort of information, you can really start to understand what's happening in terms of um, increased flow or other activities that might be happening in the catchment that are affecting um, our water quality. Okay. All right. So this is a study we did looking at um, cows and streams in, in wet areas. So we, we basically wanted to look at Given the cows are, are in this paddock which had a number of, of just small waterways running through it um, and they're given free access, how much time do they actually spend there? Um, and, and how that varied with different times of day and, and between the different cows. So do all cows spend the same amount of time or do some cows like water more than others? So we had several mobs of cows that were fitted with with GPS collars, so there was a total of, of seven events in the study where we had different mobs in different paddocks. Um, each of those paddocks had been high um, density mapped so that we knew exactly in the paddocks where all the waterways were um, and where all the wet areas were. And so we mapped those out and we, we applied a five metre buffer zone around each of those, those wet areas because the precision of our GPS, particularly when the cows were down in the bottom of the gullies, wasn't perfect. So we knew where they were plus or minus five metres. So we said if they were within five metres of a stream, we would consider them to be in the stream or at least interacting with the water in some way. Um, and so these events were in four different paddocks um, and they were conducted over three years. And the picture there um, is a cow wearing one of our GPS collars. So they, they just wear them as normal and, and go about their, their normal day. And we do exclude sort of the first hour or so that they're wearing them um, as they give them a good shake and see what they can do about getting them off. Um, so in this study we, we considered wet areas. So what we've got here is not a stream but it's a, it's a seepage area on the hillside. So it's it's a boggy bit, we're calling it a wet area, it's not a stream. Um, but, so we identified wet areas as well as streams. So anywhere that the cow was basically in water. So this is one of our paddocks. Um, I'm going to come and stand over here and see if I can see better. Um, so 
we have got a number of streams running down through the paddock. We've identified our wet area, so where the streams are spread out and come above the swamp, we identify that as a wet area, and then the single lines are our streams. We identified streams from order one through four, and we only considered streams that were order two or above. So the little wee streams that only ran when it was raining, um, we weren't looking at because we wanted to see the ones that actually had water and when the cows were there. We did these studies, they were all done in July and August, so it was a, we, we were aiming for cold, wet times of the year. And also times when the cows were grazing to pretty low covers, they were on clean-up duty, so they were going through the whole paddock um, looking for something to eat. All right, so this graph shows the percentage of time over our seven events. So we've got events one through seven, and the percentage of time the cows spent in each of the areas. So the green graph represents time spent in what we're call, calling a non-risk area, so neither a stream nor a wet area. And you can see that actually they spend most of their time not paddling around in the cracks. Um, and you can see it's a stream is blue, and then we've got wet areas in red. And you'll notice these two have no time spent in the wet area. That's because those paddocks actually had no wet areas. Um, and so cows spend less than 10% of their day on average um, in a stream or a wet area. And if we looked at it in terms of number of minutes per day that cows are interacting with, with the water, so <coughs> mostly about an hour a day that they spend um, in the water. And that compares with some previous literature where those numbers range from six minutes a day um, up to, to 60. Um, and one of the reasons we think we're seeing quite a high number is because our cows can move about the paddock, they actually have to cross waterways numerous times. Um, and whereas in these studies, they really only, you know, they went to a pond and they drank from it, um, but they didn't nearly cruise through the pond to, to go about the paddock. Um, so it's higher than, than some of the previous studies, but that's partly the nature of our paddock and probably also partly that we did impose that five metre buffer. So some of the time those cows were actually wandering up the side of the stream um, and we've picked that up as them being in or near the waterways. When we looked at, did this vary over the day? So we thought, you know, maybe as they'd been in the paddock longer and longer and the covers were going down and down, were they forced more into those swampy boggy bits looking for something to eat? Um, but actually we see for most of our days they spent between about 94 and 98% of their time in a non-risk area. We get a few days at this end where they spent 10% of their time in the wet areas and one couple of days up here where they spent um, very little time in the wet area. But in general there didn't seem to be much variation between the day. When we looked at what do they do over time? Turns out cows are quite a lot like people. When would they most likely to go in the water? In the mid-afternoon. Um, but I would point out this is July. It's on the hills over there. Um, I don't think any of these days it was warm enough for an afternoon swim. Um, but so what we see now, I will just point out we've changed the axis here. So this is now 80 to 100 percent. Just so we can see that a little bit better. But what we're seeing is that from about one o'clock through to seven o'clock is when they're most likely to, to be in the stream. Um, helpfully, that's also the time that all our city dwellers are driving home and looking at the cows in the paddock too. We also had a look at um, how much variation there was between the cows. So this is each individual cow is represented as a different bar on this graph here. Um, and for each cow, this is the the minim minimum amount of time she spent in a non-risk area through to the maximum amount of time she spent in a non-risk area. Um, and, and we've got the, the bars are representing, or the, the lines across the middle are representing the mean time for each cow. So what I want you to see is that we've got one cow up here who never ever got her feet wet. Um, 
And then we've got these cows who generally get their feet pretty dry. And down here we've got, you know, I don't know what she was doing, um, but we've got cows here who actually were much more willing to interact with the waterway. So we thought that was pretty interesting. We had a quick look to say, these cows we know who their mums and dads were. Um, we had a quick look to say, you know, was there some heritability to this? Looks like no. Um, but it was highly repeatable. So um, the cows who like to stay dry generally like to stay dry, and the cows who like to swim can play with swim. So maybe there's a bit of learning that's happening there, and we can somehow discourage our cows um, you know, and, and all become like this cow. Um, Alright, so cows with unrestricted access spent about one hour per day um, in the riparian area. They tended to go there mostly in the afternoon, um, and we would like to do some more research to look at, you know, what, is this, what does this look like in summer? So this was done in the depths of winter, maybe it's quite different when it's um, a dry summer. What are they actually doing in the wet areas? So we just had a GPS point that said that cow was there. We didn't know whether she was having a drink, whether she was urinating, whether um, you know, she was grazing because the covers were low. So we'd like to have a look at what, they, what they're actually doing there. And then, because there seems to be quite a bit of between cow variation, um, can, we, uh, can we influence why some cows go there um, and some cows don't? And we've, we've just recently bought a collection of, of new GPS collars, which hopefully will let us um, track the cows a bit better. Alright, so the next thing we did um, was look at whether or not we could change where the cows went um, by thinking about where we fed them hay. So, we know cows contribute nutrients to waterways. They do this by being in or near the water. They do this indirectly through leaching and through runoff. And we know that there are areas where cows like to hang out. And so, where the cows like to hang out, they tend to create a concentrated collection of nutrients. And if you put this concentrated collection of nutrients where water's going to flow through it and wash it straight into the stream, then suddenly you've got a critical source area. So, we wanted to have a look in a paddock like this. So, you know, in some. Oops, In some cases, these cows are camping quite a long way from the waterway, um, but because of the slope and the soil type, that those nutrients will end up in the water anyway. So we wanted to have a look at, could we change where the cows camp, and, and how much, where we chose where the cows camp, um, how much could we influence the water quality as a result. So this is a, a background study that we've had that shows on the first side here, this is the GPS points of the cow. So where we've got a darker point, that means we had a lot more GPS points there. So where it's dark, the cows tended to hang out there. And then on this side here, we've got a pugging map. So our soil team walked all of those paddocks, um, GPSing a whole series of points going, you know, what's the pugging here? Is it, is it pugged or not? And that, that was immediately after these cows um, had been in the paddock, you know, behaving like that. And so here where we've got red areas, we've got um, severe pugging. And so we've got a number of areas um, where the cows are congregating. So we've got a dark blue point, but if we look at the corresponding spot on here, um, there's very little damage. So the cows can hang out in those spots without combing up the paddock. And then we look at other spots where the cows have congregated. So that corresponds to here and here. And they've hung out there and they've made a right mess of the paddock. Um, so we wanted to look at, well, wouldn't we rather they hung out here where they don't make a mess of the paddock than here where they make a big mess? So we wanted to see, you know, what can we do to convince the cows to come and hang out where we want them to hang out? So, in this study we had two herds of 16 cows. Um, they were in five hectare paddocks. And we put them there for the first two weeks with no supplements, so we just let them in the paddock and said, how do you cows like to interact in this paddock? 
And then from week three to six, we started feeding them two barrels of hay um, per herd per day in the same spot every day. And we picked those spots, and Lucy's going to talk about exactly how we picked those spots um, shortly. And we put GPSs on those cows in week two. So in the last week before we gave them supplements, once they'd got to know the paddock and they'd pick, you know, chosen them what their habits were going to be, and we put them on in week six. So after they were well accustomed to knowing that every day at nine o'clock they were going to be fed hay right there. So in the first paddock, this is what they were doing prior to supplementation. So again, this is a heat map showing where the GPS points go, and we've got favourite camping spots here, here, and here. Then we started supplementing them here. Um, and in this paddock, the point we chose to, to supplement them was a pretty unpleasant pleasant spot. It was chosen to be poor soil quality, um, it wasn't very well drained, and it was a bit of a, a muddy, rocky spot. Um, and what we saw is that so we've moved them ever so slightly from here up to here where they're camping. Um, they've got rid of this camping spot entirely, but they've actually held on to this spot here as one of those nice well-drained spots where it was quite a nice spot to sit. Um, and they said, actually, no, we, we did quite like to keep camping here, thank you very much. When we did it in the second paddock, um, so again, in the first pre-supplementation, so they've got a, a preferred camping spot here, and a preferred camping spot here. And post-supplementation, so this time we fed them out somewhere nice and dry, where it actually stayed a reasonably pleasant spot to be. Um, and they went, yeah, all right, we quite like that, and we'll come and camp here for you. And so they've completely given up their camping spot over there. Um, that's actually the water truck um, in that top corner. So that's success. Um, certainly where we fed them, in a nice spot, they were quite happy to come and camp there. Um, we couldn't convince them to come and, and sit in a bolly horrible hole. Um, so when we looked at, at their behaviour, feeding them out, we thought maybe they'll just all, you know, mooch around the corner and go, come on, feed us. Um, but they didn't. The total distance walked each day remained unchanged. Um, but their camping behaviour changed, particularly in the paddock where the hay was offered in a nice, um, sort of strong soil in a sheltered spot. So there's potential to use supplementation to change where they want to sit, um, but obviously we'd need to do a bit more, more research to de determine you know, how predictable it is where, where they're going to go and then what actually are the drivers of them, them choosing to sit one place versus another. Um, but what was really clear, and, and it's, I mean, it's no surprise, the cows certainly increased the time they spent in the spot that we supplemented them. So wherever you supplement them, you're going to get a build-up of, um, of nutrients, and so selection of supplementation sites does need to consider the soil types and, and the proximity to waterways and things like that. Um, and Lucy's going to pick up on that a bit more. Uh, before I start this next session, um, I just wondered, did anyone have any questions? Because, sorry, we forgot to ask between the last one. Yep. say that when the five metre, in that five metre buffer zone that they're in the water is quite a big stretch but, um, and I just wonder if you want to speak to that if there's any way you can tighten that up and just have it to like in the waterway or within a metre of the waterway because five metres is for a cow is, I, I agree. It's a, it's is a quite a, well, is um, that five metres either side or is that five yeah. metres in total? So, so, so it's so ten metres wide strip then? Effectively yes. Because some of the um, little streams will only be like sometimes a metre wide, yeah. or fifty centimetres wide. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the reason we we chose the five metre buffer is because the GPS isn't precise enough to locate the cow exactly. So we wanted to pick her up any time she was in the stream. We wanted to to see her. So that has resulted in an overestimation, um, and we. 
are looking at things like uh, we've now got some motion sensor cameras, so when the cow is, we'll, we'll be able to put that on the stream, and when the cow is, is in that zone, we'll be able to look at her and say, well, is she actually in the stream or beside the stream? Because, um, yes, they do graze up and down the, the bank, but um, when the cow is within, I mean, gen generally when she's within the five metres, she'll be having some influence on the waterways in terms of treating damage down the edges and things. And these particular, where the stream banks are quite steep. And, um, but yes, it's, it's definitely an overestimate that we've got. Going. Okay, so this uh, next study, um, uh, it was a, um, a like a, no, I won't say an add-on, a, a beautiful addition to the study that um, Rebecca just talked about. So, um, so they were really interested in trying to move animal behaviour using um, uh, winter feeding. And so we thought, well, this is a great opportunity to, to work together and to try and look at um, if, if we actually feed our animals hay in winter um, and think about where we feed them, think about soil types and their uh, susceptibility to surface runoff, um, can we actually influence the amount of nutrient and sediment um, that we lost? So this was a master's project um, by uh, Petra Franson. So Petra's now working for the Greater Wellington Regional Council. Okay, so this was the, the big idea behind this study. So um, if we feed hay on particular soil types that have a lower risk of surface runoff, can we actually influence, in a really low cost, easy way, can we influence um, the amount of nutrient and sediment loss to our waterways? Okay, so this study um, was in the same area that Rebecca's just talked about, but we just selected two small catchments. So where she said they fed animals um, and, and the animals' the behaviour moved to those areas, um, she's talking about the actual feeding sites that I'll talk about now. So these are um, small catchments, about 0.3 hectares in size. They need to be small so we can actually capture all the water that runs off them. Um, so this, this outside boundary just shows the outside of the catchment. Um, and so these red lines are where the water flows, so the water flows to this point here, and that's where we're capturing our nutrient and sediment. Um, so this particular, this first one, first catchment, uh, is a Korokora soil type, so it's imperfectly drained, and it's, it's got a low to medium phosphorus retention capacity. So this is our, what we call, higher risk soil. The second site was a Ramiha, a elephantic soil, um, really well drained, beautiful texture, um, and it's got a high pea retention capacity. Um, so again, all the water's running to this point here. So we'll add in our feeding sites. So this is where we fed our hay, roughly. Um, it was positioned the same distance from where we're monitoring, so we could compare. Um, and let's have a look at our results. So, um, so this is the sort of damage that the animals created. They were fed hay in the same position. Um, I should point out too, actually, we'll just go back. Um, Originally, um, our um, farm managers tend to feed hay um, near this area here, so um, it's quite close to the track, it's quite convenient. Um, the alternative you know, that we tested here takes a little bit more effort. I need to open a few more gates and, and sort of get across to the other side of the paddock. Um, but you know, this, we we're interested in testing this idea. Um, is the conventional spot uh, more risky than perhaps an alternative spot? Okay, so. Okay, so let's have a look at the data. So here's our two soils. So I've just called them um, imperfectly drained and the well drained. Um, so the first thing to note is that on the imperfectly drained soil, um, we generated, um, what have we got? 4.9 times the amount of water in runoff. So we collected nearly five times the amount of runoff. So already that tells us that we're in a bit of trouble in terms of sediment and nutrient loss. Um, and so this is reflected in the sediment loss. So we measured um, 49.6 um, kilograms per hectare of sediment and only about 20 on the well drained. Um, so two and a half times the amount of sediment came off this um, imperfectly drained site compared to the well drained site. Um, and again, um, I haven't got the number up there, but seven times more phosphorus was lost from that imperfectly drained soil. Um, Nitrates, another nutrient we're always interested in on the well-drained soil, um, because we're measuring surface runoff, we didn't actually measure any nitrate. Um, that's not to say that nitrate didn't go through the soil profile. Um, but what we concluded from this study is that a strategic placement of um, winter feeding uh, on robust soils can provide a really, um, I guess, uh, 
cost-neutral option um, for farmers in terms of reducing sediment and nutrient loss. And all it requires is a bit of knowledge about the soil types and, and perhaps where water's flowing um, and just um, choosing those spots um, you know, to try and um, reduce any impacts on the environment. Oh, okay, and that's me again. Did anyone have any questions about that section before we talk about hill country cropping? Um, the question was about transferring reticulated water to do the same job. So can you explain what you mean a little bit more? Oh, so this is to change the animal behaviour? Okay. We would love to get in and have a proper look at that. Um, these paddocks actually had water troughs um, and we've, we've been through the data trying to have a look at, um, you know, could we identify you know, if the cow was far from the trough, was she less likely to to go in the, or she was more likely to go in the creek, you know, briefly for a drink? Or um, our data's not good enough that we've collected so far. We've had we've had a good go at trying to figure out whether she's in the trough for a drink, or you know, she's going to the trough for a drink, or whether she's in, going to the creek for a drink. Um, it's definitely on our radar to to have a look at that. So, so the question is, is there any data to suggest cows prefer to drink out of a trough than, than from a creek? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, cows prefer clean water and cows prefer being able to drink without standing in squishy mud because they find that a little bit I don't know, threatening and from an evolutionary perspective maybe they're, they're at risk um, there. Um, so, so yes there's potential but but no, there's no real data to say. And, you know, arguably there's, we would have to investigate things like the placement of that trough. So if you put the trough at the top of the hill and the creek's at the bottom, is she going to bother climbing the hill for a, a clean drink or would she rather just take the easy option? Um, and I would argue cows are not that different from people. Um, but we'd, we'd like to get in and have a look. Um, but I think thinking about placement of of water troughs is equally as important. Okay, cool. So um, we're just going to talk about, I'm going to give you a brief overview of another student project. So this project was started by uh, Josie Winters, who did a, started a master's with us, but got snaffled by Greater Wellington Regional Council. There's a bit of a trend going on there. Um, so this study was uh, looking at, you know, the growing trend towards uh, Heli cropping, um, spray and pray, spray and yay, um, but basically s uh, spraying out of pasture and surface seeding uh, winter fodder crops. Um, so just, um, actually I should just um, give a bit more background. So uh, this study was undertaken in the same small catchments that I just talked about with Petra's study. Um, so it gave us an opportunity to sow crops into those areas and um, then capture the nutrient runoff uh, and measure that. Um, but just in terms of the actual crops themselves, so on these two uh, catchment areas, the Korokora was the imperfectly drained soil and the Rimiha was the well-drained soil. Um, so our germination uh, rate was similar um, at the start. Um, and our total yields um, were fairly similar, although we had a higher amount of weed infestation on the um, well-drained soil. Um, we, we, weeds was a bit of a problem, I'm sure any of you who've tried to grow a winter crop, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and we did have a, quite a dry summer, so um, yeah, we found that a little bit challenging keeping on top of the weeds. So um, yeah, but the, so the total um, yields, a bit lower than industry, um, you know, I guess the, the typical industry values that we've seen, um, but you know, respectable enough. Um, Okay, so we grazed our crop in uh, June 2016. Um, we're very aware of the work that's been done in Southland on um, developing best management practices for grazing winter crops. Um, because there's been very little research in this area, particularly on measuring nutrient and sediment loss on hill country cropping. We're quite interested in using just a conventional approach and, and measure you know, what some of the potential impacts might be. So you could consider that this might be, a, um, say, a worst case scenario because we did graze our 
area from um, the bottom of the catchment um, in two halves, so graze the first half and then um, graze the second half. Um, so this is what our uh, sweet crop looked like after um, about a week of grazing. Um, and not surprisingly, as we removed, started to remove ground cover, um, as they ate the sweet um, tops and then started to chew into the bulbs, um, we, get, we started to get quite a lot of soil damage. And so um, this is an example of one of the water samples that came from the day I took um, that photo. And so already we're starting to lose um, quite a lot of sediment. Okay, so let's look at the, the overall numbers. I'm going to just break this up into the different phases of the crop because I think it really helps to illustrate the period of time that's most critical in terms of nutrient sediment loss with these sort of um, systems. So um, this first stage is, is when the, the area is under graze pasture or also um, that we've sown the crop but we, but we haven't grazed it yet. So we've got full ground cover basically. The, the point. So because this is over that summer period, we had very little runoff over that period. So we've just measured runoff here, tricky unit, but um, in millimetres. Um, so um, very little runoff over that period and very little nutrient loss. Um, so they're very, you know, quite low compared to um, what I'm about to show you. Um, so here's our period of crop grazing. So we graze for, I think, a period of about, is it 10 to 12 days, 10 to 15 days perhaps. Um, and so again, because it was only a short period, we didn't have a lot of runoff over that period. I think we had two events that generated some runoff. Um, so about, um, and, and you'll note here, we've got more runoff on this uh, imperfectly drained soil compared to the well-drained soil. Um, but look at this jump in sediment loss. So even though we're only losing um, a little bit in terms of volume of water runoff, um, suddenly our sediment loss has jumped up to 104 kilograms um, per hectare. And consequently, we're seeing a you know, big jump in nutrient loss as well associated with that. Um, but the area that I guess this, the, the period that we, we're most concerned about is this post-grazing period. So this is a period the, ca the cows have come out, they've finished the grazing, but there's still complete bare soil um, and there's no grass cover whatsoever. Um, and by this stage, you know, we're right in the thick of winter. Um, so we got most of our runoff losses over this period. So um, 101 millimetres of, of runoff on the uh, imperfectly drained soil and um, 43 on the uh, well-drained soil. And, and this is reflected in the types of losses that we, that we measured. So our sediment loss has gone up to one tonne per hectare um, and consequently we're losing 0.7 kilograms of uh, phosphorus per hectare 4.6 kilograms of nitrogen, this is in total nitrogen, um, and yeah, um, similarly for the other nutrients as well. Um, so you'll notice with the, the well-drained soil, although we're still measuring quite high losses, um, that's having a huge impact in terms of, um, you know, the risk is a lot lower on that soil type. So it's well-drained, we're getting less surface runoff, um, and so cropping on that soil is certainly, um, you know, perhaps more favourable. Okay, so what does this look like in terms of our water quality? Um, so here's two uh, samples. So the one on the left is um, the well-drained soil and the one on the right is the um, imperfectly drained soil. So these samples were collected on the same day. So you can just visually see the difference. So a lot more sediment loss in the um, imperfectly drained soil and that's resulting in a lot more nutrient loss as well. Okay, so just to sum up, um, so sediment losses were 5.5 times higher on the imperfectly drained soil overall. Um, and the losses associated with those three months um, that involved both the grazing and the post-grazing period um, resulted in a total of 1.1 tonnes of sediment per hectare, um, 0.83 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare, and 5.4 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Um, and, you know, having done some other studies, like the winter feeding crop study that we did with Petra and some other studies that we've done at Tuapaka, um, it was really clear that this practice, this winter, winter um, cropping practice, um, resulted in nutrient and sediment losses that were orders of magnitude higher than what we previously measured um, from other management practices. Um, and, yeah, so this really raises a concern, I guess, and, and it really highlights that, um, you know, 
some management, some really active management is needed around some of these practices um, if they are to continue. And not just perhaps strategic grazing, but I think perhaps we even need more than that, whether we have to divert water into sediment ponds um, before it gets to um, waterways. You know, that, that's something that we probably need to be thinking about. Okay. Is that us? Yep. Oh, questions? <laughs> Good question. We've just had a slewy plan done for our farm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know offhand, but I could find that out for you if you if you need. Yeah. Um, so the slopes were similar. We did measure slopes over the area. I can't I can't remember offhand what exactly they were. Um, so the Rumiha was quite gentle at the top, but where we placed our um, catchment area, the slopes were actually similar between the two sites. Yeah, no, so we haven't done any other work in this area, um, but there has been some other work done in Southland, um, and that was under cultivation, that they sowed their winter crop. Um, there are increasingly more studies in this area because of the, the interest, um, but we, the, I don't, we don't personally have any data looking at cultivation versus um, surface. Yeah, that's possible, and that's something that we really should get some data on, um, just to be sure. Sorry. Um it measures the nutrient loss in the surface runoff. Um, nitrogen's pretty, um, dissolves into the soil moisture. On the well-drained soils, do you find that there's a lot of nitrogen that's being lost through the soil and, 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 and through the, the groundwater? Yeah, so we didn't measure uh, drainage losses, um, but we assumed that it, that it has. So particularly the Remiha, it's a well-drained soil, so it's possible that the nitrate has gone through the profile. Um, through other studies that we've, uh, we've got with um, PhD students, we know that that particular soil has a really good capacity to denitrify uh, nitrate. Um, so potentially um, on that site, even though the nitrate might have gone through the profile, it might have um, denitrified before it got to groundwater. So these are the sort of things that we really need to understand about our soils in hill country because potentially there's these natural attenuation processes that are happening um, that can be a real benefit in terms of, you know, in, when we come to the state of um, regulation, for example. Um, so the question was, do we have any um, numbers on the value of the... Um, so the question was actually about the nutrient, but I think we should ask the same question about the soil, um, because soil has value as well. And so um, I haven't got that to hand, but we could easily calculate that, and we probably should. That would be quite interesting. Um, but it is really important to think about that soil that we've lost, because one tonne over a hectare, I haven't done the calculations, but it's probably you know, a decent layer of soil that we've lost from our topsoil. Yep, so the question was, uh, have we looked at hill country cropping under sheep grazing versus cattle grazing? Um, no, but that, again, that's something we'd like to do. We'd really like to do a lot more research in this area because I think we really need to have a better feeling of, you know, how best to manage it. Um, before we did our study, we did a bit of a um, survey through some of our industry context and contacts. And although, yes, lots of people um, graze winter crops with sheep, um, you know, there are plenty of people grazing with animals, uh, with cattle as well, so. We'll wrap that up here. Um, thank you, Rebecca you and Lucy. Um, and they'll be around for a while yet if you've got any other burning questions. I'd like to thank each of you and everyone give them a round of applause. <laughs>